Oh, hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marty Switzer. I'm the, the CEO of Tango Asset Management. I know many of you in the room today. Thank you very much for coming. A lot of uh, supporters, which we're very grateful for, and some new faces as well, which we're you know, very excited to be I guess, showcasing WCM International Small Cap Strategy 2. This is um, you know, WCM is a top quartile global equity manager from Laguna Beach, California. Tango has an exclusive retail distribution arrangement to distribute WCM to the retail market. This particular strategy we're talking about today, WCM International Small Cap Growth Strategy, has been a fantastic performer. It's um, last 12 months, it did 37% after fees. Uh, you know, since uh, inception, the last six years, it's averaged over 25%. And, and for those of you that are familiar with the WCM process, it very much adopts, I guess, the two key principles of moats and culture. Um, unfortunately, today, uh, the portfolio manager, Greg Ice, has had a, a personal situation arise, so he can't be with us, but we've got the, the next best thing is 2IC, um, Lok Lokshman uh, Ben Kataranam. Uh, it's fantastic to hear, he's very deeply involved in the portfolio, so he'll be presenting. We're also going to have another um, fine portfolio manager dial in, Dr. Brian Huerta, who you know, understands, I guess, the, the, you know, the, the process of WCM around moats and culture, uh, you know, and can go into that in very sort of deep detail. That will be the first part of the session. We'll then serve lunch, and during lunch, we'll have a macroeconomic update from uh, Peter Switzer, one of the country's leading business and financial commentators. No relation, I should say. And um, we're looking forward to uh, that part of the presentation. So WCM will give you, I guess, the very much the bottom-up sort of approach, and Peter will give you a macroeconomic update. And Pete, you know, very nice to have you here today. But without any sort of further ado, we're, we're going to throw to, um, to Lakshman. I'm going to ask him a few questions. Uh, he'll talk through uh, the, the, the philosophy, the process, the portfolio. He'll get into some of the companies, talk about how WCM is investing right now, and then we can open the floor for questions as well. So thank you very much for coming. Um, Lakshman, can you hear me okay? I can. Uh, and uh, I, I, first, I mean, Greg sends his apologies. Uh, he had an emergency he had to attend to, uh, but uh, we are very delighted to have you uh, listen to us, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look, there are a number of people in the room that are familiar, Lakshman, with the, the WCM uh, investment process, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But for those that don't know, can you just give us a bit of background about the business? Absolutely. So the firm was uh, founded in 1976, and really, uh, it went through a lot of trials and tribulations, different owners, but it uh, settled upon its current philosophy and process somewhere around 2006, seven, and the team has been very consistent since then. The process and philosophy has also been consistent. We are based in Laguna Beach, uh, as Marty said, and uh, we are a long-only asset management shop. Uh, we are a growth boutique. Uh, it's 100% employee owned, and uh, all of us are generalists, and there's a reason behind it, and I can talk to it as well at some point. Uh, we have five or six strategies, and between those strategies, uh, we manage somewhere between 80 to 85 billion. Uh, there, is, uh, there are sister teams uh, for WCM, but uh, the team here in Laguna is managing all the global growth strategies, and it's uh, one consistent team and process and philosophy. I'll pause there so that we have enough time to talk about the process, et cetera. So, Marty, if you want to drill into anything specific about the firm, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, there are 67 employees, 28 of which are owners in the business. But look, I guess what's really made WCM, um, I guess, well embraced is, I guess, the uniqueness of the investment process. Um, Lakshman, maybe you could talk us through, I guess, the two key attributes and how that relates to the portfolios that you manage with WCM. Absolutely. And uh, the two key pillars that differentiate us uh, from the crowd is uh, mode trajectory and culture. On more trajectory, we believe most of our peers focus on the size of the mode. Uh, everyone wants to buy companies that have a very strong competitive advantage. What differentiates us is that we are focused on the direction of the mode. Uh, it is more important for us that the company that we invest in is expanding its competitive advantage. And uh, the companies that we invest in generally do so by either developing new sources of competitive advantage or they are getting better in their existing sources of competitive, competitive advantage. And as a result, they are generally taking share from competition 
or doing something differentiated, which enables them to grow faster than the rest of the market. The second piece I would say differentiates us from the crowd is the culture. And I would say my personal experience, I joined WCM because we believe we have a very phenomenal culture. We love to work here. We love to come into the office on a daily basis. And we believe it's an important reason for our success. And uh, we completely believe that firms that have a great culture that is aligned with the competitive advantage generate uh, outsized returns over the long run. And uh, uh, the final piece, if you would, uh, there are not many companies that fit this, these two attributes and therefore we tend to run very concentrated portfolios. Uh, the small cap strategy holds anywhere between 50 to 70 names on an average. Um, Lakshman, maybe you can just drill down a little bit in, in terms of some of the, I guess, the, the, what you actually do with regards to how you actually analyze culture. So you have a full-time culture analyst, you've got the collaboration with the Harvard professor, James Heskett. Maybe just talk through some of, I guess, um, the techniques you use to determine what a culture is like within um, a company and then how you apply that to the, to, to the investment process. Uh, yes, uh, and thank you. And, you know, and uh, uh, the... One thing to understand is why we have culture as uh, one of the things that we focus on, right? And if you go back to the history of the firm, and you know, I've been in the firm a little over a year, so I'm sure people who have been here longer can talk better about this, but the culture was not always great. And it was always a revolving door. And uh, you know, the founders, the owners today actually bought the firm from the previous owner and actually completely changed the culture, did a 360 and you can see the results today. And therefore we believe that we want to kind of actually invest in companies with great culture. But having said that, it is very difficult to define what a great culture is. And if we said that we have perfected the art of analyzing culture, that would be kind of an incorrect statement. Uh, we are still learning, but what we try to do is we are trying to assess how the company will behave when no one's looking or how people behave in a company when no one's looking, how people behave when times are bad, because we believe that's the ultimate margin of safety. You know, that is what, uh, you know, that is one of the sources of good downside capture that we have in our portfolios. And there is no one way to do this. Uh, there is a bunch of different questions. And one of the reasons we like that aspect is because it is very difficult to replicate. And we find that most people, most of our peers do not believe in, uh, using culture as a tool. Uh, we spend a lot of time, to your point, uh, we have had a Harvard professor come and talk to us in depth about this. And uh, you know, we also, beyond that, invested in a full-time analyst who completely devotes all his time and energy towards culture. And uh, it goes from a, a set of exhaustive questions that we talk, uh, we ask our uh, you know, companies that we invest in, we also do a lot of checks with former employees of the firm on what their experience was with the firm, how the firm treated them when things were bad. And uh, essentially we sort of, it's a mosaic and uh, we put all these pieces together and come up with some sort of picture of what the culture is like. And uh, it is not quantifiable and which is why we just cannot kind of tell you uh, you know, if we can assign a particular number to a culture, uh, you know, it is hard to say what good culture is, but when we see it, we understand what a good culture is. And we certainly understand what bad cultures are, and we make every effort that we can to kind of avoid companies that have bad cultures. And I think you understand that because I guess you've invested so much in your own culture. It's one of the things you talk about, you know, you see, you know the firm very much walks the walk as a full-time mm -hmm. culture officer internally. So there's learnings from your own business journey that you've been able to apply the companies in the portfolio we're lucky enough to hear Kurt talk yesterday and one of the things that he mentioned uh, Lakshman was I guess um, you know it's, it's more of an art than a science it's very much a proprietary process that you use but he talked about the term scuttlebutt research from um, I think Phil Fisher uh, that's something that that is that, that is I guess a big part of how you actually uh, determine what a culture is like effectively you know, investigative journalism police work acting, you know, finding out information and putting together a mosaic. That, that's correct. I mean, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, to your point, it's an art. And uh, like I said, uh, if I uh, said that we have perfected the art of analyzing culture, that would be a mistake. We are constantly evolving the process. Uh, 
you know, one of the things that we, uh, one of the efforts underway here is to how to improve upon that assessment. And, uh, you know, recently we've also hired consultants who actually also do a deep dive into the corporate governance aspect uh, at much greater depth than what we have done in the past. Uh, you know, we constantly talk to professors and experts on culture to come and talk to us and help us improve this. And, uh, you know, uh, there is no one right way to do this. There are several different ways to do this. And uh, one of the things that we are proud of is that all of our colleagues have very different uh, backgrounds. And as a result, they have very different takes on culture. I mean, the culture in India is very different from the culture in China, for example. And uh, what uh, the different backgrounds help us is to actually assess the culture with the right context, because to have a similar expectation from a company in India, when you compare it to a company in the US would be incorrect. And therefore having a local context is also important when we assess cultures of companies. So it's an evolving process. We are constantly striving to get better at it. And uh, I think it is a process that will never end. That's very much, as we've said before, a full-time culture analyst in the, in the process of point, appointing another one. We can make um, you know, that analyst available at, at, um, at you know, any point in time if uh, you know, anyone in the room wants to understand more about the actual process. But look, it's a good segue to the next question. You mentioned it before, Lakshman, um, you know, the downside capture. You know, how has the strategy managed to uh, perform um, or I guess um, so well on the downside? Talk, talk us through that whilst you know, still capturing so much of the upside and we sort of, you can see that through the numbers. Absolutely, Marty. Thank you for that question. So first, I mean, we do all the things that you would expect a good growth manager to do. You know, I mean, uh, we avoid excessive leverage. Uh, we are very sensitive to uh, poor corporate governance. And uh, there are a bunch of other things that we do that is uh, typical and that is uh, the norm. But uh, beyond that, the two things, the two things that underpin our process also is responsible for our downside culture, uh, downside capture. The two things that uh, differentiate our process are mode trajectory and culture. Uh, mode trajectory, we find that companies that are expanding its competitive advantage actually perform better in downturns. So usually these companies are gaining share when uh, you know things are bad. Uh, the, usually the competitors are actually falling apart and that gives an opportunity for companies which have a positive mode trajectory to get even better. Adversity is actually a good thing for these kind of companies. The second thing, I think this might sound a little bit corny, but you know, I think culture is the ultimate downside capture, really. I think, like I said, I mean, culture, we define by culture by sort of trying to assess how employees behave in a particular company when things are bad. And, Usually it is the bad times that determine how the company does in the long run, right? And I would say uh, we do things that are typical of most growth managers. And on top of that, the more trajectory and culture focus also adds to the downside capture. And to your question on, uh, you know, how do we actually perform well in up markets? Uh, uh, it again goes back to what we focus on. It's the more trajectory and culture. We find that, I think, our belief is that companies outperform in the long run for a very simple reason. The reason is that they beat expectations over the long run. And we find that companies with a positive mode trajectory and good culture, we use the term defy the fate. And it's another way of saying they defy the expectations. And as a result, these companies continue to surprise positively for a very long time. Most investors uh, tend to sort of revert most companies to the mean pretty quickly. If we are doing our job correctly and if we are finding companies with positive mode trajectory and good culture, we find that these companies tend to defy the fade and therefore beat expectations for a lot longer duration. And therefore that sort of portfolio leads to our performance even in our markets as well. Um, and just, um sort of close out that, that point on, I guess, the downside capture um, uh, strategy. Uh, what is particularly, um, I guess, important to note, the you know, downside capture is 67% in the small cap strategy. Um, you know, you, you've achieved that result by being sort of fully invested. You know, you're, not, you're not going to cash, you know, cash more than sort of 5%, which 
guess is, a, is, is an important, important point, isn't it, Dr. Shreem? I'll be uh, remiss not to point out, you know, I mean, uh, you know, 2020 was case in point, right? I mean, it was the one of the strategy's best years. And, you know, I mean, we found uh, it was a true uh, live experiment for our strategy where, you know, our portfolios did, especially small cap growth, did very well during the really disastrous year for many of our peers. Can you talk us through some of the key features um, of the, the strategy? Um, you know, number of number of stocks, sectors, uh, sort of geography. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, like I said initially, we tend to hold somewhere between fifty to seventy stocks, and uh, generally, when we can find a lot more ideas, uh, you know, it tends to be on the higher side. And uh, and currently, we are finding a lot of really good ideas and. Uh, as a result, uh, we hold somewhere around 70 uh, stocks. Uh, uh, we don't actually, we are not uh, intentionally trying to avoid any particular sector. However, organically, because we focus so much on more trajectory and culture, uh, organically our portfolio is typically overweight to technology, consumer discretionary, industrials, and a few other sectors that you would expect a typical growth manager. But I would say that is just a manifestation of the current environment. If we were able to find the good mode trajectory and culture in energy sector, we would happily own that as well. So the sector uh, you know, uh, dispersion versus the index is more a result of our focus versus an intentional uh, versus an intentional portfolio construction methodology. And uh, countries, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we do not, uh, we are trying to be country agnostic, but generally, again, uh, we, uh, our bottom up portfolio construction leads us to country overweights and underweights. Yeah, I used to say before, a bottom up manager, and um, you know, a lot of your, your, your peers and colleagues um, you know, don't like to make predictions on the, I guess, the macro. Um, environment, but can you sort of give us you know, your view on just the current landscape, but probably more importantly, you know, what are the countries or sectors at the moment that you think um, are interesting for Australian investors to consider? Uh, I mean, uh, to, uh, like you said, you know, I mean, uh, we are not uh, bottom, uh, not top down, and you know, uh, I will you know, caveat my comments because I haven't been great at predicting. Uh, things from a top-down perspective, uh, we are much better bottom-up stock pickers versus not. Having said that, uh, we find a lot of attractive opportunities in countries like uh, Japan and uh, even in India. And uh, so many of the Nordic countries are also always a source of great ideas for our portfolio, really. And uh, uh, the China, uh, we have uh, one of our strengths is also the, uh, you know, generalist strategy, one team across different strategies and across geographies. As a result, we have good stocks in China as well. So, uh, and I would say from a sector perspective, I think technology uh, remains like an evergreen sector. You know, we live in an era uh, where digitization is a trend that is still in, at its infancy. We continue to believe that, that it has a lot of legs and uh, we will continue to find a lot of uh, good uh, stocks in the technology sector, especially in areas like semiconductors, because I think semiconductors is uh, almost every one of us is holding something that has a semiconductor content in it. And we see that uh, expanding constantly. And uh, as a result, we have enough investments in the portfolio that are leveraging that trend as well. Can you talk us through some um, stocks in the portfolio that um, you like at the moment? Uh, uh, sorry, Marty, you uh, cut out at the end. Uh, you just uh, a couple of stocks, right? A couple of stocks that you like in the portfolio at the moment. Uh, yes, uh, I, I will talk about uh, Synergy first. Uh, it's a analog power management integrated circuit manufacturer that is based out of Shanghai in China. What is uh, uh, what does the power management integrated circuit do? It sits between the source of power, which is your outlet, and an electronic device, and it smooths out the volatility in the power source 
so that these sensitive electronic components are protected. And that's uh, the basic function of a power management integrated circuit. What is unique about Synergy is their hybrid manufacturing model. Uh, they call it a virtual IDM. IDM stands for Integrated Device Manufacturer. Uh, as many of you might know, a uh, modern fab is very expensive. A digital fab that uh, someone like a Taiwan semiconductor constructs costs upward of 15 billion. Uh, Synergy makes analog chips and even those fabs co costs a few billion dollars. So instead of deploying a lot of capital on an expensive fab, what Synergy does is they have a hybrid manufacturing model where they have a very close partnership with a outsourced foundry partner where the foundry partner manufactures their chip. But Synergy has a very strong control over the process of manufacturing. And uh, as a result, the sources of their competitive advantage are one, uh, they have a cost advantage because one, they are based in China. The engineers are relatively less expensive compared to the rest of the world. Plus the manufacturing, hybrid manufacturing model, which is asset light gives them an advantage where they do not have to invest the capital, but get the benefits of a integrated fab. Second, uh, it's also the deep relationships that they have cultivated over the years. Uh, you know, uh, this company was founded in, uh, in 2003, if I'm not wrong. And they, over 18 years, they have developed a lot of deep relationship with their customers. Uh, third, uh, the source of the competitor, the, the switching cost in this business is very high. Like I said, uh, the chips uh, protect very sensitive electronic components, which can be orders several hundreds of dollars. And the chip that Synergy supply costs a few cents, really. And so the incentive to switch is very low. And as you can imagine, over time, uh, all these sources of competitive advantage is are getting better, which is why we believe the company has a very positive moat trajectory. That is, it's expanding its moat constantly. And second, the culture. I've, I've been an engineer uh, in my prior life. I worked at Microsoft for about six years as an engineer, and I've been to their Shanghai office, and it is no different than uh, my office in Redmond. Uh, when I was in uh, at Microsoft, and uh, I can see, and the founder is actually uh, China uh, American Chinese uh, who uh, graduated from a U.S. university, worked for a U.S. firm for a long time, and then went and set up his own firm in Shanghai. So as a result, the culture is very much Western, and this is important because it is very important to attract the right kind of talent, because analog engineers are very difficult to find and. As a result of the positive mode trajectory and uh, the strong culture, we feel this deserves a spot in the portfolio. Uh, the company has done really well. Uh, you know, I mean, it has grown its uh, revenue at uh, more than a 20 to 25% CAGR, and it's still just about 500 million in revenues. We believe that companies like this can easily exceed a billion or two billion in revenues over the next five to seven years. Uh, that's uh, number one. Uh, I'll pause. If there is a question on this, I'm happy to answer. If not, I'll, uh, I'll talk about another example as well, really quick. Uh, Soitec is uh, another company in the portfolio. Uh, they are they manufacture specialized uh, engineered substrates on which we manufacture semiconductor devices. Every one of you is holding a device that has some component that is made by Soitec because they have a 100% share in uh, radio frequency chips that are used in smartphones. And the reason they have this uh, monopoly-like position is because of a technology called SmartCut that they invented 25 years ago. SmartCut, uh, basically what SmartCut does is you are able to take extremely thin slices of one material and deposit it basically cut it very smartly and you put it on top of another uh, material. And as a result, you get a composite material which has characteristics that are much more superior than the traditional silicon that has been used in semiconductor manufacturing. As you might, many of you might uh, have heard, you know, Moore's law 
is more and more difficult to maintain or keep up. And as a result, uh, things like engineered substrates will be very important in keeping Moore's law going. And Soytech has uh, 25 years, uh, you know, in developing this uh, technology, and uh, they have the, so the sources of their competitive advantage. One, 25 years of know-how, which gives them a cost advantage. Uh, second, uh, they actually have a 80% share uh, of the market. The other 20% belongs to a company that licenses technology from Soytech and therefore effectively they have a 100% share though. So it's a monopoly like share. And uh, the market is actually going in their favor uh, because like I said, Moore's law is, uh, we are struggling to maintain Moore's law and we would need the use of engineered substrates to keep Moore's law alive. And as a result, we feel the, you know, uh, the trajectory of its moat is certainly very positive. The cultural aspect was a complete turnaround. This was a really badly managed French company a while ago, five or six years ago. The founder ran it like a science experiment and almost ran it to the ground. A few external investors invested in it and uh, got, uh, brought in a new CEO and he's done a remarkable job with the culture. The company is more amenable to working with partners and uh, making great and prudent capital allocation decisions. And as a result, we have seen the results. They have grown revenues really nicely. Uh, 500, 600 million in revenues, uh, they say in the next two years, it can get to 900 million in revenues. And I think that's the first step. I think this company can grow for quite a long time. I'll pause there. Uh, I'll, uh, one, of, um, go ahead, please. one of your colleagues in um, Brian Huerta, who uh, many in the room know, Brian's a client portfolio manager at WCM. Uh, just for the questions process, Brian can also talk a bit more about the investment process. Um, I think he's going to come in now. Here he is, Brian. On mute. <clears throat> you're, on, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Good day, Brian. Okay. Thanks Good for day. joining. Thank you for um, you know, uh, obviously filling in at such uh, short notice. And Lux Luxon has done a fantastic job today talking about the uh, international small cap uh, growth strategy. We're at the point where we might start going to questions from the room soon. but. Um, that we might get you just to sort of maybe just to recapitulate, I guess, some of the you know the, the key components of the investment process at WCM and you know why it's been able to be rolled out through, I guess, the, the suite of strategies that you've got available from the large cap to the small cap, also to the long short emerging markets. But Lakshman, um, are you are you finished there on that point with regards to um, the, the, the last company? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah. If you have any other questions about the companies, I'm happy to answer them. If not, yeah, let's uh, go into some Q&A, please. I've got the floor now for, um, for, for any questions with regards to um, presentation today. Yeah, Luke. <clears throat> Thanks for the update, guys. Uh, tell us more about the culture at WCN and perhaps there might be some learnings for us within our probably small organisations that we work with, small firms, uh, which might make you a, a company of choice for employment, uh, some great cultural beliefs that you have, why people enjoy working there, that we might be able to uh, tap into. That'd be a great question for Brian. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take this on, um, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for the question. First, I think, you know, the culture is really what um, distinguishes us. We, we kind of view it as our, our, our best competitive advantage. Um, it, it, you're absolutely right. I think it does enable us to, to attract and retain the most talented investment professionals out there. Um, we're, we're quite unique. Um, you may have heard this or have seen this, but our two core values are fun and gratitude. I think that says a lot about who we are. You know, the fun, the fun part is, you know, we, we know that if you're having fun, you're going to work the hardest. You're going to, you know, bring the best that you possibly can each and every day. And having an attitude of gratitude, I think just enables you to let go of that ego um, to, um, to think about others before yourself, um, not get trapped into overconfidence or arrogance, things that can really hurt performance and destroy an organization. So um, those two things are very important. Those are our two core values. That's quite different than what you might hear from another manager that might talk about, hey, you know, what's important to us is everybody would be really smart and work hard. Those are to us, just table stakes. That's like the, the price of admission. What's most important is things like, you know, having an attitude of gratitude. It's the freedom to, to, to do things differently. Um, 
to explore um, new ideas and, and approaches different than maybe you have done them at, at prior firms. Um, so that is what I think is, is really unique about us and gives us a real distinct um, advantage versus our peers. Maybe I can add uh, something real quick uh, from my personal experience and you know, comparing and contrasting our culture versus other cultures I've experienced, right? One of the things we are very sensitive to is to not have any finger pointing uh, here, right? I mean, uh, for example, I mean, we do not have any attribution when it comes to compensation. And uh, there's a reason for that. I mean, we believe that uh, and I initially, I, when I introduced the firm, I talked about how we came to our process and philosophy after a lot of trial and error, right? I mean, we were not what we are today. And uh, we learned through a lot of uh, really bad mistakes uh, what uh, uh, we have done incorrectly. And uh, we arrived at this process and philosophy after making a lot of errors. And the only way we have achieved that is by having a culture where it is okay to admit mistakes. And I'll tell you one of the things that is uh, different. And one thing that you should have in mind is that we are a very lean team. Generally, for the number of uh, strategies we manage, we are a relatively a smaller team. And one of the reasons we are we are able to do this efficiently is because it is okay here to say, I don't know. It is okay for us to, as analysts generally on a daily basis to do just incremental work. There is never sort of, uh, you know, uh, unwarranted criticism. Uh, when you don't know, you don't know. So uh, we find that process very efficient as a result of which we are able to go through a lot of companies much more efficiently than what I've found at other firms. And it is very refreshing to be, uh, to Brian's point, uh, to be able to speak your mind, to do things differently and be okay to admit your mistakes. And uh, as a result, we kind of go through a lot more companies than what I've seen at my previous companies, if you will. Point. Yeah, John. Where's the swing to earnings? Um, but on a serious note, you've got some significant exposures to foreign countries, yet you're fully unhedged. The Australian also unhedged? Yeah. That's the second layer of unhedged. Can you walk us through why you choose to be unhedged with such an exposure to quite a broad range of foreign countries? Sure. Uh, I, 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 if I could uh, paraphrase a question, I think I heard this. Um, uh, it was, why do you, why do you not hedge, um, and, and do you expose yourself to, to volatile currencies? Is that the, uh, it, is that the essence of the question? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, well, I, we think it is very difficult to to um, make a currency forecast first and foremost. Um, and uh, we don't think it's a good allocation of our time or resource to try to do so. We've also have just, over the years, we have discovered that um, um, that that currency impact tends to wash itself out. It tends to um, even out over the long term, you know, especially over our, our investment horizon. Um, so, short answer is that it just really hasn't um, been. Um, proven to be a really good return on our time to focus on currencies. I would say just ab about our currency exposures. Um, you know, most of our companies are in countries or domiciled in, in current or have currencies that are are quite stable um, that don't fluctuate um, as much as you might think. And uh, they're actually quite the, the companies themselves oftentimes are quite diverse, and so they are hedged themselves. So we feel like you know with the, the hedging that the companies are doing themselves um, with the fact that uh, over over the long term, currency has been essentially a wash, that it would not be a good return on our time to make active decisions around currencies um, and trying to do to determine you know where we should be hedged, how much we should be hedged. We think you know sticking to bottoms up fundamental stock picking makes the most sense. Large cap strategy does have a hedge version, although it's really much exposed. Both layers. Uh, just large cap, yeah. But you manage both certain layers, you, you manage the layer between here in the US and then the exposure of fund currency of domicile or domicile? Excellent question. I'll come back to you offline on that. We've got a third party doing it for us, so but we'll, we'll get back to that question. Yeah. 
Just uh, two, Dan, questions. Yeah. two questions. Uh, one is how big is the small gas run? What's the capacity? Um, and two is you've got statistics about market caps and return on equity and so on, but you don't have anything about earnings per share growth. So I'm just curious about that one characteristics of the portfolio in that, in that sense. Okay. So I can just talk. So in Australia, we've got about 250 carved out of a, of a strategy at the moment with the same capacity globally. US is about 1.5. We'll probably go up to 1.7. It's currently about 1.3. The performance has been outstanding, so there's a lot of demand for the strategy. But Brian, is there anything else um, you want to add to that point? I just thought that was an important point for the, for the Australian investors. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we're uh, we're at about that level, 1.3 billion in, in in current AUM, and uh, we see capacity, you know, up to but not exceeding two billion. So roughly 1 1.7 is probably the upper limit on the capacity. What about the uh, earnings per share growth of the portfolio? What does that look like? The aggregate. The question was earnings per share growth of the portfolio and aggregate. Is that a, a Lakshman or, or, or a Brian? Maybe both want to comment. Sorry, Marty, I couldn't catch that question. Do you mind repeating that once? Earnings per share growth in the portfolio on aggregate? Oh, uh, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know, Brian. Do we? Do yeah, that? yeah. Let, let me let, let me take that one. I think. Um, you know, it, it's not something that we would focus on. Here, Cheryl, here's how we think about growth and earnings growth or free cash flow uh, growth is, is really just what it could generate over the next five years. Okay. Um, and, and, and what's also important too is just the diversity of growth profiles from the companies in the portfolio. Some of our companies could grow, you know, closer to 10% um, bottom line if we're looking at earnings per share of free cash flow and some of them could grow much faster than that, maybe 30% or more. Um, or even higher. Um, so, you know, it, that's that's part of the beauty of the portfolio is there actually is quite a diverse set of, of, of growth profiles. Um, and, and we really look at it on a company by company basis. But uh, most importantly, we're looking out five years. We're looking at what can the company achieve in free cash flow or earnings per share over the next five years and that's how we're going to value the company. That's most, that is what is most important to us, not what the company is going to earn over the next year or two. Because for many of our companies, they're, they're, they continue to invest. And so in the very short term, their earnings might be depressed, but they might have latent earnings power over the next five or more years that we, that we think that the street isn't currently uh, um, discounting. And that's a real key part of our investment process is just understanding the power, the durability, and the quality of that growth over the next five to 10 years. And I, I would also add that we are not targeting any particular amount of growth as such. I mean, we, uh, we do not believe that that leads to outperformance. As you said, as I said earlier, you know, I mean, we believe that companies with positive mode trajectory and culture defy the fade. And that's why that's what leads to outperformance. And we are perfectly happy buying those companies that grow 10 or 11%, but for 10 or 15 years. And, you know, I mean, grow their earnings a little bit faster, their, their revenues. I mean, if we can find a lot of such companies, we would happily fill the portfolio with that kind of companies as well. That's a great point. I think, um, you know, there is uh, many growth managers have an arbitrary threshold for growth. Um, and you could be seduced into doing such that, um, you know, selecting companies that might be, you know, juicing their near-term results at the expense of the long-term health of the business. They might be pulling levers, pulling business forward, and it may not come, or, or it may come at the expense of some of the long-term um, potential for growth. And so that, that's something that we, we pay much more closer attention to is just how's the company um, going to be positioned in five years. It's not the whole the whole philosophy around moat trajectory is not what what position they're in now, but what position they're going to be in in five years. Any other questions? Matt, you've been a huge supporter of the, the large cap strategy. You know quite a lot. Anything else? Oh, I'd, I'd be interested in. Uh, you mentioned the Chinese company before. How do you uh, how do you invest in Chinese companies? How do you view the corporate governance? Uh, just maybe some of the other strangers that you invest in. Uh, sort of similar sort of question. Do they fall under your emerging markets? Piece as well. So I'd just like to understand probably 
um, outside of your developed stuff. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting around the emerging markets and particular China. Lakshman, do you want to take uh, the, the China related sure. question? I, I heard the question correctly. Uh, if yeah. Marty, do you mind just summarizing the question for us, please? Yeah, how, how you go about investing in you know, markets like, like China and then I guess probably more broadly emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, uh, the approach is no different, but I, like I said, we are pragmatic. I mean, I made the point earlier that one of the advantages we have is a team that has very diverse backgrounds. And so... Uh, we have two people who are uh, from China. Uh, I grew up in India and we have other people from different geographies as well. So we bring in a lot of local context when we understand, try to understand the culture of these companies. Like I said earlier, trying to kind of uh, understand the culture of a Chinese company from a US lens is incorrect. And therefore we have to sort of adapt that, uh, you know, uh, an analysis uh, to the local context. And we do that uh, and we have a lot of experience and our diverse backgrounds helps us in that regard. And uh, we are pragmatic that, you know, I mean, uh, what is a great culture in the US might be different in different countries, right? I mean, for example, I mean, uh, many Japanese companies almost always, uh, you know, the uh, employees uh, always, uh, the employees are treated very differently. I mean, you will find that most Japanese employees will be in their phones for 25, 30 years which is the norm. And typically the companies do not let uh, employees go, right? Uh, is that a bad culture or is that good culture? I don't know. I mean, it's just different culture and we have to kind of take that in the context of the country that we are investing in, if you will. And what about sort of technically with investing on a Chinese exchange, like how do you actually go about that in terms of your shareholder rights? Or how do you actually do investing on them going into a Chinese company? And how do you do their corporate governance? Uh, we have a, a person who specifically looks at China A shares, actually. So she spends almost all of her time actually look at uh, looking at Chinese companies, and she's assisted by our, uh, you know, uh, culture analyst. And uh, like I said, we uh, recently also actually engaged a few people, or engaged someone to kind of look a little bit more deeply into corporate governance and help us on that aspect as well. Yeah. The one thing I might add, too, is that related to China, um, it's a good example of, um, of, of, of us just maintaining a high bar, you know, just, um, you know, any, as it pertains to, to China, I'd just say the, the bar is set pretty high for us to do real work on a company. Um, we really try to sift through the space and make sure that we're focusing our efforts on the highest quality companies with good governance, good disclosure, you know, businesses that we could understand. Um, you know, that, that, that is a driving force within our analysis as it pertains to China. Okay, I've got one last question, John. Um, you made a number of new investments last year in the middle of a global shutdown. Can you walk us through a bit of your approach to culture analysis from the Green Beach? How you can assess culture City and Green Beach, China investments in Sweden, Japan, places like that. I, I understand existing companies that makes a lot of sense. You're familiar with those, but brand new companies. How do you do it in, um, uh... Yeah. Again, I couldn't catch most of the question. It's not very audible. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll think I'll paraphrase right. it. I think it's uh, how do you do your job in Laguna Beach when you have companies all over the world? Is that essentially the question? Yeah, particularly how do you invest uh, through the pandemic? Um, we bought a number of yeah. new. Yeah, how do you assess the culture of those businesses when you're sitting in Laguna? Uh, actually, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny, actually, the COVID has been kind of, I mean, I hate to kind of uh, minimize the disease. I mean, it's been terrible for many people in the world, but it's been actually a blessing from a uh, analysis point of view. Almost all management teams are constantly available. You know, I mean, things like Zoom make it pretty much in person. We are having, I would say in terms of productivity, as high a productivity as we have ever seen. And I, in fact, I think many of us are actually also looking forward to getting back to travel so that the pace is kind of a little bit reduced in some sense, because I think uh, the 
good or bad thing about uh, being locked up in your homes is there is nothing much to do but actually talk to companies all the time and that's what we do on a daily basis i mean just uh, this morning i had two calls with experts who are formers of a company that i'm interested in and uh, we do that uh, day in day out and uh, almost all of our analysts are constantly engaged in fact during the covid one of the things that uh, when the uh, when the disease broke out and uh, was i would say in the second quarter or so we made it a point to reach out to all our companies and essentially kind of have this discussion with them as to how they are handling this from a cultural aspect and i mean and many companies had the right set of tools to deal with the disease to help their employees etc and we were very impressed by how our companies have managed through this disease and uh, you know i mean in cases where we found cultures were broken and we didn't find many really uh, we actually kind of were you know okay kind of exiting that company as well yeah i'll i'll add to that too um you know lockdown's right on the money i mean we've been able we've been more productive than we've ever been you know just having everyone together we've gone through more ideas than we've ever had um in 2020 than in any prior year so that's been a that's been a good thing and our access to 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 management and other experts have been has been really really good uh, however saying that uh, we we're really um dying to get out on the road you, you, you know i think there's going to be um, a lot of us out on the road, seeing companies attending industry events, talking to industry experts, um, you know, doing that boots on the ground type uh, fundamental work that has been so key. Um, but we, what we have is, is, as Lakshman described, is just we've become more resourceful. I've seen it uh, with the number of contacts that we've developed in 2020. Um, I think our the scope of contacts, the breadth and depth of our contacts have only expanded. And I think we've gotten a lot better with the type of questions that we were asking uh, the people that we lean on to, to develop our culture work. So um, you're, we, we absolutely would admit that uh, we're missing that face-to-face -face walking you know, around company headquarters and sites and meeting middle managers, but you know, our access has been pretty darn good and we've been able to do the job, I think, quite well, despite the pandemic in 2020. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there is no substitute to actually kicking the tires. And um, I mean, I think I, I can speak for all analysts here that we are all ready to go back on the road and actually meet the companies in person. Guys, we're out of time. Thank you very much uh, for, for helping out at, at, at such short notice. Uh, very grateful for both of, uh, both of your time and, and effort. And we look forward to having you in Australia in the very near future. I know you've all had the vaccine, so hopefully uh, you'll be here sort of around September, October. Uh, guys, Greg does apologise as well. He'd be more than happy to do uh, a phone hook up with, with, uh, with um, your respective businesses at any time. So thank you very much for, for attending this presentation.